couldn't get on. Now I got on, finally. We are glad to have you as you are. So, we have just come from Lag Omer. I'm sure many of you heard the dreadful news of what happened in um, in uh, in Israel, and um, and so I have found a relevant a relevant um, how would you call it? I found some relevant lessons that we can take from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai from the 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 man of of Lag Omer, the person that we all celebrate on Lag uh, Let I would like to present to all of us some ideas that we can benefit from um, from his teachings. And with that, what we need to do is share the page of this of this class. And you guys are gonna have to bear with me. But, so we're talking about Lag Omer. And we have some lessons to learn from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, from his son, and um, and and uh, we're going to touch them also with a comment from the Rebbe. And altogether, it kind of makes this these lessons that we can take home for ourselves: lessons of strength, lessons of assuredness with Hashem's promise of caring for us, with God's care for His people, and. And let's jump straight into it. So the way we've done this in the past is that we're gonna we read together some of the texts, and then and then we comment on it. So what we'll do is I will ask, um, I will uh, we'll go around and we'll ask everybody to take a piece in reading along with us. But Bef- right before we start to read, I want to give you an introduction because I think it's important to be thinking about what period of time historically is this whole conversation happening why does rabbi why does this engagement that we're about to read about happen well what happens so in as you can see right there on on the screen there is this conversation that happens with rabbi yehuda rabbi yoisi and rabbi shimon these are all these are three great rabbis from their period of time in 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 the talmudic early talmudic early mishnaic period the time of the mishnah and there's someone sitting amongst them who um, who you might want to call a snitch. Um, I don't know if that's a useful term, a snitch. I don't know if we allowed, if we say it like that. He's a guy who's going to listen in on what the people are talking about and report it back to the governor. Report it back to the government and say, well, this is what the people are saying about you. You should best uh, follow up on this and take care of it. Well, in our case... Um, the conversation is with these great people, and they're talking about what the Roman government has done for the land of Israel. And so, as, as you can see on the third line over here, they built marketplaces, they built bridges, and they built bathhouses, and the rabbis talk about it, and what are the values of it? Why are the Roman people building in Jerusalem, in Israel, altogether? What, how did they end up over there? Well, they're there because they've they've just conquered the land, they've just taken over, and now they're in this position where they're able to they're in this they're in the position where they're able to change what's what's happening um, in they're in this position where they're able to change the way the land runs. They're able to change the way the land operates. They're able to improve things. But at the same time, they're also forcing their way into, into, the, um, into society. And they're, in for, they're, they're making the society behave in the way that they want, that the Roman people want that things should be. Let's take a look at source one. Now that we understand the context, of what's going on and what time period this is. Let's read together Source 1, and I'm going to... um, Who are we going to ask? You know, Robin, you're brand new. We'll pull you in. Can you read for us Source 1, the one that's on the screen? Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, and Rabbi Shimon sat together. Yehuda ben Jerim sat beside them. Rabbi Yehuda commented, the Romans have done such wonderful things. They built marketplaces, bridges, and bathhouses. Rabbi Yossi was silent, but Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai responded, they've done it all for themselves. They established marketplaces to house prostitutes. 
bathhouses to pay for themselves and bridges to collect taxes. Yehuda ben Gerim repeated their conversation and word reached the government. They declared Yehuda who promoted us shall be promoted. Yossi who remained silent shall be exiled till Zippori. Shimon who denounced us shall be killed. Okay, so, so this, is, this is a quote from Talmud, from, it's from the Gemara, it's from, chap, from the tractate of Shabbos, page 33b, and you have this conversation. You have this conversation where they're talking about, look what's happened, look at the amazing things that the Romans have done for us, and here comes someone, one of the leaders of the generation, one of the greats, and he has the audacity to say, you know what? They did it for themselves. They did it for their own conveniences. They're not doing it for improving the greater good. Um, brings to mind, just think about this. Um, if you know, there are all these NGOs and non-government organizations that go to places like Kenya, Nigeria, and, and who knows where, and they want to improve the lifestyle of the people there. Now, in a kind of judgmental way, and I'm not encouraging you to judge those people, you should continue with your contributions, they're doing good things. However, if you could think about it for a moment in, in, in this way, they might be, a person might think, well, why, why do they need it? Why must we introduce fresh water into Nigeria? Why is that necessary? Maybe this judgmental person will say, well, maybe that person is doing it for themselves. Maybe their intention is only to um, you know, to, to find the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial way to have a good salary. And so he becomes a fundraiser. And you all know the fundraisers make big salaries, of course. <clears throat> and so, and so you, you think maybe this guy is, you know, is just doing it all for himself. Okay. All right. On the other hand, there are other ways to look at this. And as you can see, Rabbi Shimon goes ahead and presents a, an, ex, an explanation for each one of the, um, for each one of the things that the, that the Romans are doing in Israel, whether it's building the marketplaces or it's building bridges or it's making bathhouses, all of these things, they have another explanation for each of them. Okay, let's move on to the second part of source, of source one. And our aim there will be to di discover, we're gonna find over here, um, we're gonna find here what was the result of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's comment. What happened because he shared his views? Where did he end up? How did things go for him? And so let's move around the table. Let's ask Barbara, will you join us by reading out loud this page of two paragraphs? Rabbi Shimon and his son hid in the study hall. Each day his wife would bring them bread and a jug of water and they would eat. When the, daughter intense, when the danger intensified, he said to his son, she might be tortured and revere, reveal our whereabouts. So they went and hid in a cave. Miraculously, a carob tree and a spring of water were created for them. They would remove their clothes, cover themselves in sand up to their necks and study Torah all day. At prayer time, they would dress and pray and then again remove their clothes so that they wouldn't wear out. They sat in the cave for 12 years. Then Elijah the prophet came to the cave's entrance and said, who will inform Bar Yochai that the emperor has died and his decree was annulled? They emerged and saw people plowing and sowing. Rabbi Shimon said they abandoned eternal life to pursue short-term gain. A fire consumed everything they looked at. A divine voice emerged and told them, did you come out to destroy my world? Return to your cave. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. So effectively, what happens, what happens right here in what we just read? Rabbi Shimon is ex takes on himself a like, kind of self-quarantine. He goes and hides. He hides, and then he and then he figures out that it's going to be too dangerous for him wherever he is right now. He takes his son with whom he is. Um, close and they study together and they, you know, they're, they're colleagues in a way and they go to hide in a cave. And, from the, in, and they survive in their cave with a carob tree with a spring of water and they have this thing with changing their clothes. If you're interested to understand that, then make sure to ask, otherwise I won't tell you. And they, they're in there doing their thing and they study over there and they pray over there and they connect over there and it lasts 12 years. By the way, 
for all of all of us young participants on this call, 12 years is a really long time. Lots of things can change in 12 years. Not only can lots of things change effectively, um, they get a new emperor and they, the decrees are annulled and they're able to go free. And now that they're free, now that they're out, they head out of the cave, they leave the cave, the two of them together, and what do they discover? They discover that the people are involved in normal lifestyle. Remember, these are two sages who just spent 12 years buried in the sand, quite literally, um, you know, you have that image of the ostrich with his head in the sand, right? They're buried in the sand and they've been totally focused on study, on prayer, on spirituality. It's like, it's like yeah, being, in a, being in a mountain somewhere. They're not connected with the world at all. They come out of their cave and they discover that people do normal things. People work, people farm, people uh, just live a regular 2021 lifestyle. And they look around, they say, what's the deal? And the effect of their surprise, the influence of their surprise, um, uh, as it says, burns up everything that they see until as a godly voice, a heavenly voice comes out and says, stop destroying my world. That's not why you came out of the cave. Go back to the cave. But no, I, what I'd like to point out from these two paragraphs is really notice the self-affliction um, that these sages take upon themselves. In a time of physical danger, they're forced to hide away from family, away from their partner, their spouse, away from their schools, away from a regular diet. They're eating carobs and drinking water, and that's it. They don't even have a, a wardrobe. It's one garment and sand, and they're hiding. Why are they hiding? Because it's a time of danger. It's a time of danger when Rabbi Shimon's life is quite literally at the stake. And so we move on to source number two. And I'm going to ask who can we, who else can we, who can we ask to join us? Um, let us get um, Professor Blumenthal. Would you join us in mm -hmm. reading the, um, the next slide? Sure. They went back to the cave for 12 months. Then they reasoned the wicked are judged in purgatory for 12 months. A divine voice emerged and said to them, emerge from your cave. They emerged. Whatever Rabbi Elazar would, whatever Rabbi Elazar would strike, Rabbi Shimon would heal. He said, my son, the two of us studying Torah is enough for the world. As the sun set on Shabbat Eve, they saw an old man rushing with two bundles of myrtle branches. They asked him, what are those for? He answered, in honor of Shabbat. They said to him, isn't one enough? He answered, they correspond with Torah's commands regarding Shabbat. Remember it and safeguard it. Rabbi Shimon said to his son, look how precious mitzvot are to the Jewish people. Okay, thank you, Professor Blumenthal. So what do we discover here in this second, in this third slide? They finally get out. And now the younger, the younger fellow, Rabbi Elazar, is, is perhaps you know, leaving a bit of a wake behind him. But his father, Rabbi Shimon, is now in a state where he can fix anything. Um, and um, and the, the Talmud continues to tell us a story how they're going out in the street and they're, they're meeting someone who is carrying two bundles of myrtles. Myrtles, by the way, they smell really nice. So this is how he's decorating his house for the Holy Day of Shabbos. It's like having flowers. And he, he's bringing them into his house these two bundles, and they say, what's the deal? And he says, one is for Zachor, and one is for Shamor. One is for honoring the Shabbos, one is for keeping the Shabbos. And, you, and, and so what do we experience? We see how the, the Rabbi Shimon is now interacting with a Jew who's doing his regular and small and, and um, personal, his own personal gesture of connection. He's doing what he can to... Um, to, to honor the Shabbos. Now, perhaps someone would like to take a guess. What do you think Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son studied while they were in the cave? Okay, we're going for a guess. Anybody want to raise their hand, tell us a suggestion. What did they study while they're in their cave? 
Okay. Tractate Shabbat. Boom. Tractate Shabbat. Okay. Well, that's a good guess. I appreciate the guess. And maybe they did. Maybe. The uh, Jewish tradition tells us that they studied Jewish mysticism. And afterwards, when they finally emerged from the cave, that is when Rabbi Shimon wrote his well-known book, which most of you have heard of, the Zohar. If you've heard of the Zohar, nod your head. Okay, I can see some people are nodding. All right. So you've all heard of the Zohar. The Zohar is the source of most Kabbalah information. And, um, and it is further the source of nearly all Hasidic information. And it is complex. It's written in a language that is hard to understand. I'm not going to tell you not to try and read it. Go ahead and read it. But if you don't get it, you can come sit next to me and we will not get it together. How's that? Deal? Okay. Well, um, we may we may feature some Zoharic texts in our curriculum today. We will. We'll do something Zoharic, and we have the translation, so you don't have to worry about uh, about the uh, about understanding it right. Nevertheless, Rabbi Shimon continues on in the next slide. Rabbi Shimon has a lesson to learn from this, from his experiences as he's buried. And he teaches the following lesson. And I'm going to take the, uh, the liberty to read this, although we'll get a chance to get everybody else to read as well. We have this one comes from Talmud, Tractate Megillah, page 29a. And it says, Rabbi Shimon Bar Ben Yochai says, Come see how precious the Jewish people are to God. Wherever they were exiled, the divine presence went with them. The divine presence went with them to Egypt. As it says, he brings a, a verse for this. He says, He quotes a passage which says, Did I not reveal myself to your father's house in Egypt? The divine presence went with them to Babylon. And he also has a verse for that. He says, For your sake, I was sent to Babel, to Babylon. So in both of these verses, you see how God is saying, I am with you in Egypt. I'm with you in Egypt. I'm with you in exile. I'm with you in Babylon. And likewise, when they will be redeemed in the future, the divine presence will be with them as well. As it says, the Lord your God will return with your captivity. It doesn't say he will bring them back. Rather, he will return. This teaches that God will return together with them from the exiles and so what we discover right here is how close is how god travels with us he goes with us into the exile into the deepest and darkest places we are not alone i think that's 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 the take home message from this part of the class is we're not home alone we're not alone we're not here by ourselves let's take a look at what the rebbe's comment on this teaching is going to be, and I'm going to call on Carlos. Carlos, can you read for us um, this slide, please? Yes. <clears throat> uh, the Rebbe, Rabbi Shimon's teaching and its message. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, come see how precious the Jewish people are to God. Wherever they were exiled. Uh -oh. Hold on. There you go. The divine presence went with them. The divine presence went with them to Babylon. When the Jewish people are in exile, God does not merely gaze down from his palace to watch his people and send them his blessings. Rather, the divine presence went with them. God goes into exile with them as well. Wherever they were exiled, the divine presence went with them. Moreover, God feels their pain. In their suffering, he suffers. God puts himself in a state, so to speak, where the non-Jews begin to ask, where is your God? Okay, turning the page. Um, let's ask Carlos, can you, not Carlos, you just read, I mean, Juan, Juan, can you read for us the next, this slide? Yes, Simon Bar Johai continues. And likewise, when they will be redeemed in the future, redeemed in the future, the divine presence will be with them. As it say, the Lord, our God, will return 
with your captivity. It doesn't say he will bring them back, rather he will return. This teaches that God will return together with them from the exiles. Even with the knowledge that God remained with us in exile, we might assume that uh, at the moment of, the, of redemption, God will go out ahead of us, even if only for a single moment, a single moment. In this regard, Rabbi Shimon Bar Tohai tell every single Jew, you can rest and sure that God will remain with you during every moment of exile, and he will not leave even a moment early. He will live only when the entire Jewish people live as well. This teaches that even when we are exiled, we have got full support and he provides us with everything we need to fulfill Torah and its commandments to its utmost, utmost. In the world of Rabbi Shimon, wherever they were exiled, the divine present went with them. Thank you, Carlos. So what we what we catch out of these two slides, we take a lesson that um, that yes, the Jewish people are in exile. Yes, we're not in our holy in our holy land. We're not together with the temple. We don't have all of our our regular arrangements or environments what we would naturally and inherently belong in. But still, we know that we're not here alone. We know that as a nation, we're meant to be here. This is where God wants us. Not only is this where he wants us, this is also where he is as well. As we saw the verse, God is with us in Egypt. Now you might think, you might think that yes, God is with us, but he doesn't, He's not with us on a literal level, on a literal level. He's not experiencing the same experiences that we do. And so for that too, we have a we have a pasuk. The verse says, Behold Sarasam Loi Tsar. This is from Yeshaya, from the from the prophet. It's part of one of the prophecies. He says, in every area that the Jews are, whenever whatever situation there are, they are in, God is filling it with them. And, and on a similar note, we also, know, we also know from other verses that as we are in exile, so God is with us and he doesn't go away. He doesn't leave us here alone. And soon when Mashiach will finally come, we will go out all together. It's not that God is going ahead of us and leaving and you know preparing the party in advance. No, God comes out at the same time as all of us. What is a possible lesson that we can take home from this? No matter the circumstance, no matter the environment, we know that this is pre, pre that this is planned. This is from Hashem. This is what this is what He this is what He's created for us. And even when it's uncomfortable and even when it's difficult, we are still together with Him. And if we're with Him, we can do the things that he would like us to engage in. We're able to engage in the same practices. We're able to do the very same things that we need to do in, in a non-exile experience. We can do them just now too. And we, we definitely can't say, well, I'm in exile now. I can't do what I'm meant to. I'm not able to, I'm not able to practice the way Hashem wants me to. I'm not able to perform the things that, that, I'm, that, is, that are needed for me. We can't say that because we're together with him. He's with us. He's given us the same instructions together with us, um, together in recognizing that we would be in, a, in this kind of environment. And so we go to the Parsha of the week. We can, take a, we can find a verse in our Parsha to talk about. Well, you might, for those that have reviewed the parsha already, so you would have discovered that it, at some, that at the end of, or in the middle of the parsha, there is this whole conversation about the um, 
the the it's uh, what do you call them? It's kind of you know negatives. It's if you're not going to do what Hashem wants, if you're not going to follow in His way, then you will have this punishment and that punishment, and it goes on. And in fact, when the when the Torah reader reads those verses in Shul this Shabbos, he is meant to um, read them not in a whisper but more quietly. He's not meant to read the upsetting and negative and um, punishment verses with the same excitement and loudness experience that um, that he would otherwise um, that he would otherwise otherwise read the rest of the parsha. So let's take a look at this pasuk over here, verse uh, chapter twenty six, verse forty-four. It's in our um, parsha, and we're going to ask. You know, I think we have to start again from the beginning. Let's ask uh, Robin. Will you read for us um, this slide? So first verse, um, first the verse, uh, source three, please. Despite all this, while they are in their enemy's land, I will not be revolted by them, nor will I reject them to obliterate them, to rescind my covenant with them, because I am the Lord their God. Shmuel said, I will not be revolted by them, nor will I reject them to obliterate them. I will not be revolted by them. In the days of the Greeks, I will not reject them. In the days of Nebuchadnezzar, to obliterate them. In the days of Haman, to rescind my covenant with them. In the days of the Persians, because I am the Lord their God. In the days of Gog and Magog, the Messianic era. So from the from the verse um, right over here, you see Hashem says, even while the people are not following and doing what they're meant to be doing, nevertheless, I will not be revolted by them, nor will I reject them. You know, when um, I mean it's hard, it's hard to repeat this over, but right in the post-Holocaust era, and even actually right before it. People, some some rabbis or Jewish leaders were saying that this is a punishment from God. This is the this is God saying you didn't behave well, and so therefore we have to um, therefore we have to uh, go through these experiences. But a, that kind that kind of thought process flies in the face of these of this term of this verse. I will not be revolted by them, nor will I reject reject them to obliterate them. It's definitely not God's way. To be punishing us, and when you come into the 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 quote from Megillah, which Robin read for us over here, Shmuel Shmuel quotes the same verse: "I will not be revolted by them, nor will I reject them." And he goes and he uses each term. Each term in the sentence has a moment of Jewish history connected to it. And so you can see, "I will not be revolted to them." That's reference to the time of the Greeks. I will not reject them. That's reference to the time of Nebuchadnezzar, which is the second exile, um, the second exile from, it's the first exile from, um, from the temple. Uh, to obliterate them in the days of Homer and to rescind my covenant with them, that's the days of the Persians. And he concludes, because I am the Lord, their God, this is the messianic era. This is the moment at which point now, we're already, God is saying, I'm with you guys. I'm not giving up on you. I'm not throwing you away. God forbid. Quick quick question, Rabbi, if I may. Please. Yeah, it, there seems to be the omission of the Roman exile there, or is that considered the messianic era? You have busted me. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, um, I'm guessing, my guess is that the days of Nebuchadnezzar is probably possibly referenced to the Roman era too. And if it's not, then I don't have a good explanation for you. Okay. Aside from here, this is okay. This is, I can make this up also, that maybe this sentence from the Talmud was said prior to the Roman exile. Oh, oh, right. Oh. Okay, that got me out easy, right? That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Points for me, okay. And here I promised that we would study something from the Zohar together. So in this case, we're pulling up a piece that was said by Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon. And he gives a new interpretation of the same verse that we just read. 
So instead of having a, the, you know, the previous verse seems to be, it's like a pause, like, even though they're bad, even though they're not behaving, I'm still not going to give up on the people. But in this section of the Zohar, we discover this conversation, which will leave us with the feeling of, it's not begrudging, it's actually an expression of God's love. And it is a story of a bride and groom. So the groom is, you know, an, an illustrious um, a, a aristocratic person. And he falls in love with a lady who works in the leather tanners market. Now, for all of, for all of us hands-on people who use, um, who make our own leather or buy fresh leather from the, from straight out of the tannery, you know that it stinks. It's a really smelly job. In fact, as a digression, um, if, a, if, a, if a husband decided mid-marriage that he was going to change his career and become a tanner, that would be enough of a reason for his wife to force him to uh, give him a divorce because it is such an ugly work it's like, for example, um, present company excluded, uh, if a person was a garbage collector or, or better yet, he had to sift through the garbage at the garbage collection spot to, uh, I don't know, to put some stuff in recycling and other stuff elsewhere. You know, that kind of job is, is it's uncomfortable and it might, might leave you with a smell on your way home. So a person who, who works in this work is it's just not nice. So the Zohar tells us a story how a, a, a man falls in love with a lady who works at, in a tannery. Now this man, had she not, had he not had to do with this lady, he would never go to the tannery. But now, because she works there, so he says, I want to be there. For me, it's important to be with my, with my love. I will be in the tannery. I will be in the tanner's market. And so let's go straight to the third paragraph on this section. And I assume that you guys read the first two while I was talking. And if you didn't, so while I read the next, you'll get a chance. So paragraph three here too. Even while the Jews are in the land of their enemies, which would in other words be a Tanner's market, God is not revolted. Now that Zohar wants to know why is that so? So he says, he gives the following explanation. He says, the Hebrew word, the Hebrew continuation of the verse is l'chaloisam. L'chaloisam means to obliterate them. But if you, can, if you can play the Hebrew word well enough, you can see how the term for bride, kala, is found in the same word. L'chaloisam, you have the word kala. And so we can read from this, because his beloved bride, the love of his life is found there, so he's willing to go. The terrible stench seems to, to him as the finest aromas of the universe, because his bride is there. Just note that last line, so you guys can all log off in a second, because Rabbi Yossi said it was worth coming just to hear this teaching. Should I continue? <laughs> should, I, should I continue with my uh, prepared conversation notes could just go home with this well Robbie so what do we have over here we have this story this lesson how God is with us even in this most uncomfortable moment even in this time where we are behaving like we're in a tannery we're smelling like we're in a tannery and by the way I don't mean a bo we mean a we mean behavior behaviorally our lifestyles don't necessarily fit with the lifestyle that, that the angels have in heaven. I don't know if we're meant to have that kind of angelic lifestyle, but in that, in, you know, in the, um, in the abstract kind of way. So God, you know, God could say, well, I don't want to hang out with these guys anymore. They're, they smell, they're not performing. They're not doing what we need. They're not living up to expectations. Nevertheless, God says, this is my bride. And I'm going to come with them and I'm going to be with them any way. And now we return to a comment from the Rebbe, a teaching from the Rebbe. And we'll ask Barbara to read for us. And this 
teaching that we're about to do focuses on um, it, it, it takes it just a bit further. It takes it further to teach us not only is God not running away from our smell, no, God loves this smell. So let's take a look, let's experience this, and we'll do this slide, and then we'll ask who will continue the next one. We'll ask Professor Blumenthal to continue with the next slide. So Barbara now, and then Professor Blumenthal next. Okay. In addition to the teaching of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, there is also a teaching from his son, Rabbi Elazar. He was also a lofty individual, as Rabbi Shimon personally attested to. No, well, there's humor there. His teaching adds meaning and understanding to the teaching of Rabbi Shimon. The Zohar cites a teaching from Rabbi Eliezer on the verse, despite all this, while they are in their enemy's land, I will not be revolted by them, nor will I reject them to obliterate them. He explains it with a parable about a bride in a tanner's market. The market has a foul smell, but because of the groom's great love for his bride, the odors don't bother him. To the contrary, they seem to him as the world's finest aromas. This means as follows. Exile is compared to a tanner's market. In spiritual terms, a market is a public property which is open and susceptible to influences that obstruct God's singular presence. And being a tanner's market, it has a terrible odor, which is a far cry from the godly scent of the offerings and the incense in the holy temple and in our day from our prayers. When the people of Israel are in exile, they are like a bride in a tanner's market. She might be tainted by the stench, but on the other hand, it is only an odor. The exile doesn't impact us internally like food and drink, which is ingested into the body, because from the day we left Egypt, every Jew was declared a free man who can, who can never truly be subjugated. And furthermore, there is no freedom like the study of Torah, our sages said. The exile is merely a scent. Its impact is eternal. Oh. External. Okay. And um, uh, was it, did it say external? Did I read that wrong? External. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, Professor Bumas, I'll give us one more page. Sure. This is the beauty of the Jewish people, says Rabbi Elazar. Not only is God always with them, as his father Rabbi Shimon taught, moreover, even when they are tainted with the bad odor of the tanner's market, God still loves them so much that it smells to him like the best aromas in the universe. And I, I think that's a fantastic thing to, to experience right there, that we, you know, it's, it's beautiful. It's not, it's not bad. It's not smelly. It isn't uncomfortable. It's beautiful. Our father in heaven loves us. Um, for anyone who's had a, a baby, um, you can, you may have uh, once seen the child like totally dirty. Maybe he defecated and you have to clean him up. You don't clean them up with like disgust. Uh, this is gross. It's there's love, there's appreciation to the extent that someone might even think that the the actual nappy, uh, what do you call it in America? I don't know. Is, Di diaper. Uh, the diaper. Thank you. The actual diaper is beautiful. You know, the parent might have, will have so much nachas from the achievement of the child, and it's, <laughs> it's in a similar way, in a similar in a similar kind of way. Hashem, even though we smell, yes, it, it didn't change our insides, but it, it did change our outsides. God comes with us. He doesn't just come with us. He loves it. And what does that mean for you and I? That while we're here in exile, we don't think, hey, we're, you know, we're alone. We're doing our own thing. God doesn't want to see us anyway. We have such, you know, we've, uh, we've performed such different behaviors in the past. This Instead, this lesson teaches us that just as we are now, that is how God loves us most. And this leads us straight into numbers. Part three of this, which is why does God, why God loves. And over here we have a deeper understanding in Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Elazar. So let's ask Carlos, can you please read for us this page? Yes. On a deeper level, God sees that despite the Jewish people being in exile in the Tanner's market, Surrounded by negative odors, they continue to observe the Torah and its commandments and raise their children in the spirit of Torah. 
In other words, he sees that the bad odor of exile didn't weaken their connection to Torah and its commandments, but to the contrary, it helped awaken their deepest resolve to strengthen their connection to holiness and to Judaism, and their example inspired other Jews to strengthen their own Torah and mitzvot and to raise their own children in this spirit, illuminating the exile with the light of Judaism, Torah, and mitzvot. This brings God to the greatest sense of nachas. It is the world's finest aroma because it emerged from a place of difficulty. And if we can just stop for a second and pay attention to that line, it's the world's finest aroma because it emerged from a place of difficulty. And as most of us can attest to, we've seen our, our, our young ones or younger people that we mentor, and they're going through a hard moment, and they're working hard on, on achieving a goal, and they fail once, and they fall through a second time, and then finally they get it, and it just feels so good. You're so happy. I'm so happy for that person who's finally achieved what he's been waiting to achieve, what's been so important to him to do, he's finally done it. And that's, that's a great feeling. And it's a similar way. When we do what God wants here in exile, it's so much more special to God because he knows I dumped them in the worst situation and they're still doing what they're able to do. Okay, <laughs> let's take a look at a comment from the Zohar. And let's ask Carlos, uh, not Carlos, uh, Juan, will you please read for us source number six? Someone open and say, the prophet say, as soon we honor his father and his servant, his master, a son must honor, a son must honor his father because Torah command, honor your father and your mother and mother by providing him with food, drink, etc. Don't assume that you are absolved after his passing. To the contrary, although he died, you must honor him even more. Because the Torah say to honor him. When a son bears off the straight path, it is definitely an embarrassment to his father. It uh, certainly dishonored him. If the son returned to the straight path and correct his deeds, he certainly honored his father. He gives, his, he gives him honor in, his, in this world among the people. And in the next world before God, before God, God show him more compassion and sit him in a more honorable place. Yeah. And so, oh, okay, thank you, Juan. So what you what we discovered right there is that a, a child has to honor their parents. And when the child does what the parent wants, that's a way of honoring them. And so the, the Zohar, the, whoever's saying this, um, this piece, says, well, Rabbi Elazar, he is a perfect example of someone who's honoring his parents. As you can see, Rabbi Shimon's prestige is now grown. It's grown in both worlds, in this world and the next world, more than ever during his lifetime. He merited to have holy children and holy descendants, and it concludes, happy are the righteous um, who, merit, who merit holy children and holy descendants. In their regard, he said, all who see them will recognize and they and they are seed blessed by God. Amen. So what you have over there, what, what, what do we have? We have this notion of why the father has so much enjoyment from the child because they're so deeply related. And finally, let's, let's take a look at this piece from the Rebbe, another piece which will show us, um, will delve into the connection of Rabbi Elazar and his father, Rabbi Shimon, and take home a message from there. So let's ask um, Barbara, will you come up for us? And then Bar Robin, can you do the next one? In light of Rabbi Lazar's expansion upon his father's teaching, the Zohar concludes, a son who honors his father. An example is Rabbi Elazar who honors his father in this world and in the next. 
In other words, Rabbi Elazar delivered his teaching after his father's passing on Lag Baomer, when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was already in the next world. And nonetheless, Rabbi Elazar continued to honor him. Although he died, you must honor him even more by revealing and explaining the depth and profundity of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's teaching that the Jewish people are so precious to God that he accompanies them into, the, into exile, strengthening Rabbi Shimon's prestige. Okay, and Robin. The message from all the above is that we have immense power during times of exile and we therefore have the ability and the responsibility to add in matters of Torah and its commandments. We will thereby merit the fulfillment of the verse, God will return with your captivity. God will take the entire Jewish people out of exile and leave the exile together with us for the true and complete redemption. Lagba Omer. Thank you. Okay, so what do we have? What do we have from all of this? So much, so much content, so much information. What's the message that we can take home from here? So before we take some suggestions from the team, I will make the following observation. And, and then I'd like to hear what everybody has to share in this conversation. That is what we've seen through a bunch of different sources, how we're in exile. Hashem has put us here. Hashem put us here deliberately. But nevertheless, he promises, I will not let go of you. I'm holding you by your hand. I'm leading you forward. I'm with you at every step of the way. And I'm not coming out earlier than you. I'm coming together with you at the same time. Together with that, we have another notion. We have another notion that is that everything that we do here in our world, in our exile, has extra special value to God. It isn't a small activity that is meaningless. It's actually very valuable. It's so valuable that God takes it and God, you know, as if to say, plays with it. God enjoys it. He deliberates on it. He, he tastes it and, and, and enjoys it uniquely. And that is the time of exile. That is the... Um, okay, I'm back. That is the unique, um, that is the unique value of, an, of, of this time now that we're in in our service of God. So that's definitely one take home is that when we're together, now that we're in exile, we can still perform the very same way. I'd like to open the table. If somebody wants to make a suggestion or an idea of a comment on today's, on today's topic, please go ahead. <laughs> 